people um, joining, as you know, through the, the, um, the, the hurdles that you need to, to do to join the call. So as we start, I'm asking that everyone who's on the call to please put your name um, and the country from where you're calling from or, or uh, on your computer in the chat box. We like to know who you are and we welcome you to the call. So um, uh, officially the call is open. I'm Julie Dargis, the Senior Advisor for the Core Group's Global uh, COVID-19 Response. As many of you know, Core Group is a consortium of 185 international health organizations, researchers, donors, and individuals working to advance the health of women, children, and communities around the world. Core Group has over two decades of experience supporting coordinated responses to worldwide health. Since early February, Core Group has been coordinating regular calls to address the many emerging aspects of the global 19 pandemic. So for all of you who are on the call, welcome to Core Group's biweekly coordination call number 15. In this call, we will provide an overview of the work of the Core Group Home-Based Care Task Force, including how partners are adopting the, the home-based care guidelines developed and published by the task force. In mid-March, the world became a virtual community overnight. Within weeks, Core Group convened a group to address the issues around home-based care. Our moderators today will be the Home-Based Care uh, uh, Task Force co-chairs, Barbara Mufaletto, she is the Program Manager of Cure Americas Global, and Nicole Grable, Social and Behavior Change Consultant for the COVID-19 Technical Response Unit at Mercy Corps, both core group members, who will provide a presentation of the Home-Based Care Task Force, including an overall framing of the uh, Home-Based Care Task Force guidelines. Today we're going to have two case studies, one global and one country level, to highlight what is working and innovatively how others are adopting the guidelines. And finally, for those who have just joined the call, welcome. Uh, please put your name and country from where you are uh, currently based in the chat box. And we will begin with the first polling question asking you what continent you're calling from. And with that, I will hand it over to Barbara and Nicole, who will be the co-moderators. And again, I wish you a really fantastic call. Thank you so much. Thanks, Julie. Uh, David, can you go to the next slide, please, while we uh, wait for that poll to come in? Great, thanks. Maybe just uh, the next one after that. Thanks so much. Okay, so my name is Nicole Grable, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Home-Based Care Task Force group, for those of you who are just joining now. Um, Barbara and I will be talking through uh, how we created the Home-Based Care Reference Guide with the task force team. Some of them are on the call, so I'd like to welcome our task force team members, if you're on the call, um, please go ahead and, you know, if you want to put something in the chat, um, that way people can be more familiar and also reach out to us individually with specific questions. So I know we have Florence on the call, we have Debji, um, and for any of those of you, uh, you who've joined um, just in the last minute, please go ahead and say hello in the chat. So as we go through the discussion, we have Rumbi from the Ministry of Health and Child Care in Zimbabwe, who's going to be uh, sharing the case study about community and facility-based provider training and discharge accompaniment using the home-based care reference guide for those recommendations at the community level. Uh, we also have Helen with Medic Mobile, who's going to be talking about the digital use application as well and how they're using it um, within their work. Uh, next slide, David. Thank you so much. We also have some um, special guests from Kenya. Um, we have Anne and Lynette on the line from LVCT um, Health Kenya, who are going to be sharing with us some practical applications during COVID-19 around sexual and gender-based violence and what they're doing at the community, at the community level, as well as their recommendations for um, the health. We also have Florence on the line, who's a core person in our uh, task force for the home-based care team. 
and she is a senior technical advisor for health and nutrition with Food for the Hungry, and she'll be sharing a little bit about what they're using the reference guide for uh, with their care groups in DRC, Rwanda, Kenya, and Cambodia. We also will have Brian Nachipo on the line, who is with us from the Zimbabwe Ministry of Health. Um, he's an advocacy and communications officer, and uh, I mentioned Lena already. So thank you very much, um, for everybody, for being here, and we're looking forward to the discussion. Um, next slide, David. Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Barbara Muffaletto, um, calling here on behalf of Care Americas Global. Thank you, Nicole, for introducing everyone who's on our call today. We're very excited to be here. Um, so at the beginning of our call, um, you know, we first asked, where are you calling from in the chat box? And then we asked in a poll where you're uh, calling from, as we know that being able to see data aggregated really helps us better interpret it. Um, so we can see most people are calling here for, from North America great representation from Africa. And, um, you know, we're, we're very much lacking in Antarctica and Australia, but we'll work on that for our next call. So thank you guys for tuning in from around the world and to be here with us today. Um, next slide, please. And uh, next poll. So um, to continue with learning a bit more about you all um, and to help kind of guide our conversation later on when we talk about the contents of the guide, um, I'd like for you all to rate on a scale of one to five how much you know about COVID-19 prevention and home-based care, um, with one being very little um, and five being a lot, practically an expert. So if you wouldn't mind doing that now, we'll return to those later. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, while you all enter those, those poll results in, um, I wanted to go ahead and start talking to you about how this guide came about, um, briefly covering what it includes, and then talking to you about the future, what our next steps are before we move on to our case studies. So in April, when the group came together, um, we could see what was happening in the health systems in Italy and the US and around the world, and we just, we realized that there was going to be a need to provide information and guidance on home-based care. Based care. Uh, we knew that the pandemic would spread to many countries where we all work, and we want to provide practical guidance that is grounded in evidence and global guidance. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? And so the core group home-based care task force convened. Um, these organizations listed here are the 15 core group member associations who have been just, you know, all stars through this whole process. They've been, uh, you know, attending weekly meetings, reviewing documents, um, really uh, bringing their professional experience and insights to help make this guide. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to show them here, you know, to show that this is, you know, this was really a truly a joint effort, um, it's a collaborative effort. and having all of these eyes and um, expertise on this knowledge just also or on this guide helps us um, you know be sure that it's the best it can be and we hope to continue to improve it but I, I we feel pretty confident with all of these inputs from all these organizations that it will fit many contexts around the world and um, is very comprehensive next slide please So again, thinking back to April, it almost feels like a different world from today, honestly. You know, many, many countries had gone into lockdown and there was just really still so much that we didn't know about COVID-19. Um, and as I said earlier, we did know that if the virus was going to be as widespread as we thought it was going to be, that a lot of work needed to be done to fortify and prepare the, the low resource areas of the world, the fragile areas. Um, and you know, we knew that in many areas, because of the lack of medical supplies, the lack of staff, equipment, health facilities themselves, we knew that much of the care for those, especially those presenting with mild symptoms, um, would be going on in the home. And um, so this guide was created in order to provide some guidance on that. Um, and 
it was really intended at first when we were first envisioning the guide we thought it would be used mainly by nonprofit organizations we essentially made it for ourselves those within the group um, nonprofit organizations who have some sort of community-based program um, often with community health workers um, but as we started developing the guide we saw there could be a lot greater use and could be used by many different audiences um, we also wanted to make sure it was very important to us that this guide remain relevant and up to date with all the new information coming out you know so it felt like every day there for a bit we wanted to make sure that it was a place that people could come to and always know that they are seeing the most up-to-date uh, recommendations and information Next slide, please. Um, so just to go a little bit over our process, um, we began with a review of the technical documents that were out there. And let me say in April, there were not nearly as many documents out there as there are now, which is just great to see how the knowledge has grown in this area. So you know, we looked at you know, those who we knew we could trust, the World Health Organization, the CDC, both in US and Europe, um, national level COVID-19 guide, uh, guidance. Uh, for those of you who have read through these, you uh, may recall that they are not the easiest to digest and absorb and, and really in no way ready to be copied and pasted into marketing materials, into trainings, um, really even any sort of public guidance. And so, you know, our first step was to review and gather these materials and then bring them to our, our task force and digest them together to put them into easy to read and actionable language that could be used in many contexts around the world. Um, we also wanted to make sure that we could, um, we thought together as a group, like how can we make this a possible, how can we make hand washing possible in an area where there is no water? How can we make home isolation or you know, the creation of a sick room in a home possible where there's 10 people staying in one room? Um, so, you know, really trying to think together as a group, what are our options to create and make this guy very usable for low resource contexts. Um, our first produce, our first version was produced uh, on June 9th. Uh, you can see here on form on step three now. Um, and, you know, this was presented and shared and we just kind of put it out there. Um, we really wanted to get something out quickly and, you know, I think we like with that one, it was good. It wasn't perfect, but it was good. It had everything in there um, and we found that we got like a really great response from you know those who we sent it to and shared it with um, and for that because of that we you know continued with our original commitment to continue to update and improve the guide and so um, moving on to step four we create we worked on sort of creating a, the next version of the guide which came out in mid-july and um, also worked on creating um, materials aside from the guide to, that people could actually use in their trainings in you know a, a short document to be able to send out to um, to partners which we'll go over those a bit more in detail later I'm Nicole or Florence did you guys have anything to add here um, I think I think you know what's important to note is that through this process we've been able to get feedback from community organizations that have made the information uh, evolve and become even more applicable to uh, community-based programming. And so as we continue to move forward, we, uh, we are looking for additional input and additional information. So uh, thank you for that. That's, we're, we're really grateful for everybody's contribution. And we've also had requests for language translation. So you'll see some materials um, in the next couple of slides about what's coming and what's available. Excellent. Um, before I move to the next slide, David, could you show us the poll results? Okay, so this is going to that question before uh, we begin our conversation about how much you feel that you know about COVID-19 prevention and home-based care. Being that this is a call with health professionals uh, or public health professionals, I'd expect to see, you know, most on three or above, which, which is true. And we also can see here too, we have some people who have, um, uh, are still feeling they have a lot to learn in this area. Um, so I'll go through quickly these, these next, uh, this next slide is um, most of us are very familiar with what could be involved with home-based care and, 
and uh, COVID-19 prevention. Um, so just to briefly cover what's covered in the, uh, in the guide, um, it has kind of three main sections or three main purposes. One is to talk about how to support a person whose condition warrants home-based care. Um, it should be noted that this guide doesn't tell you when to do home-based care. This guide come, kicks in after a health professional has said you need, should be receiving care at the home. Um, so this, it goes through the next, uh, the next steps with that. So, you know, recognizing danger signs, um, the role of the caregiver, uh, you know, room setup and home isolation, and then finally kind of when home isolation can end, when can they come out of the sick room? When do we feel they're no longer contagious? Um, the other sec next section is how to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in the home. Um, so this goes to some of the, you know, the sanitation hygiene, uh, the, yeah, the sanitation practices that we've been hearing about over the last couple months with, you know, cleaning, hand washing, face masks. And I think a lot of the insights this guy, the guide brings in this area is how can these be adjusted to a context where there is no extra money to buy Lysol? There is, you know, or Lysol isn't even available. Or um, how can you use materials in your home to make a cloth face mask? So, um, there's you know a lot of context specific uh, information in this section and then lastly how to provide support to family members during COVID-19 so this covers everything from like care and essential services um, in other words what should you continue to uh, for what uh, for what services should you continue to go to a health facility to emotional support um, knowing that you know with this increased stress there's some um, ramifications for that there's perhaps increased domestic violence increased sexual assault how is uh community-based organizations do we support households and support programs in addressing this and then lastly you know food security and nutrition um, and we're seeing this you know in the u.s as well um, with just how to recognizing that covid is going to um stress uh food supply in many of these homes and how to as a nonprofit try to work with, with that and recognize that. Okay, so we have actually another poll. If you could go to the next slide, please. And um, this one's for your chat box. So it's not really a poll necessarily, but hearing that, you know, kind of what's included in the guide, one of the things we're really interested in in our task force is knowing what's missing. What would you like to see included in our next version? Um, so this is going to just, these answers are just going to be saved and reviewed by us uh, in the task force later on. Um, so feel free to add them at any point during the call. But um, just if you wanna take a moment now and jot some thoughts down, you can submit more than one thing. Yeah. And I'm now going to pass this on to Nicole to continue. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara. Um, David, can you go to the next slide, please? We wanted to review with you all the materials um, that are available and that we're working to produce. Uh, as mentioned before, Barbara said that we were trying to create some materials that would make uh, information more accessible at the community level. So with that, we put together a quick reference guide. Uh, it's a two sheet page uh, document that is essentially the key, the key messages throughout the whole guide um, all in one place. And so it's a great resource. I know how it's being used in the field for some programs where it's either being shared during trainings with providers or being printed and shared with community leaders uh, so that they can then convey key messages to their communities. So that's available um, and we'll be putting that up on the website. We also have created a PowerPoint presentation with all of the key messages that can be downloaded and used uh, for, your, for your own trainings. Um, and you can take certain sections out um, or make it applicable to your work. So you can download it as a PowerPoint presentation. You see on the left side, we have a list of languages. Uh, some of them are still in progress, um, but some of them are accessible. So we'll be, um, when we send out a follow-up link uh, uh, related to this webinar, we'll go ahead and share the link with those resources as well. Uh, next slide, David. When, as Barbara was saying, when we uh, 
were thinking about how to use the guide and how to make it applicable. A lot of us work uh, with community health workers and, and of course at the community level. We also found that there is a huge need for this um, to do work with providers. You can see here the list of how the guide is being used. So for example, with Africa CDC, we presented it as an accompaniment to provider discharge orders, if they're sending people home from the facility, if they have a mild condition, of course, all of this is based on national guidelines. So each country could um, have their own recommendations for if they're requiring people with mild cases to be in quarantine or an isolation facility, or they might send them for home-based care depending on how their health system is able to respond. So we presented this for um, Africa CDC, of course, Cure Americas, IFRC is using it in their national offices as well as as a quick reference guide for their COVID help desk. Um, at Mercy Corps, we presented it as well for the health and safety webinar. Um, Pathfield teams have access to it as well. Medic Mobile, which you'll hear a little bit more about shortly in one of the case studies, um, is using it for field application as well as we have been working in collaboration with Hesperian Health Guides and Pangea Zimbabwe AIDS Trust. Um, we'll be sharing a little bit more about their work as well in the case study to follow um, related to provider and community-based trainings. Next slide, David. Great, thanks. So speaking of how it's being used, I would like to now introduce Florence who, as you all know, is a member of our task force and she's going to talk a little bit about how um, Food for the Hungry is using the quick reference guide and just what they're doing overall with their uh, care groups uh, with their field team. So Florence, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much uh, Nicole and uh, Barbara for that wonderful introduction. I hope everyone can hear me. If you can't hear me, please tell me I can elevate my voice very dramatically. So again, thanks for the introduction and the hard work you've put into it, uh, to this Nicole and Barbara, really wonderful, wonderful work you've done here. And so I will speak a little bit about well, how the care groups are really benefiting from uh, this tool and obviously many other tools that have been developed by the community health uh, family here at Core Group. And uh, thanks for the poll. Barbara asking how much we know about COVID and home-based care and all that. And I was itching to say five, but then I realized that every time I think I know everything about COVID, something else comes up. So the 13% that said five, they know it all, I would love to be your friend. So I can uh, benefit from that knowledge because this has been quite a uh, challenging uh, disease like any other imagine diseases that have uh, come to us in recent days. So really the care group model was developed uh, with Food for the Hungry, with help from Action Against Hunger. And uh, like my colleagues, Barbara, Nicole, and Julie have uh, stated, when COVID came around, there was a lot of misinformation, a lot of myths, and it was really scary for, and for those of us who work with communities around the world, we felt called to really see what we can do to mitigate all this fear and um, misinformation and myths around COVID. Not that we know it all, I'm sure we don't. Uh, even the people at CDC and WHO, as we all know, still don't have all the answers uh, around COVID. So we at least wanted to try to see how we can support our communities around the world to provide reliable, up-to-date information as we knew it. So we developed a care group module around COVID for our, our field staff to use in uh, passing information on to the communities. And so really the goal was to inform and to really strengthen the capacity of our communities and improve their knowledge around COVID, just to make sure that that mitigates uh, the, all the evils of our the misinformation that was going around. So was some of the objectives of really to identify the sources of information, explain the importance of adopting good practices, and also key was identify what to do if someone had the virus symptoms. 
So that is where the home-based care tool comes in to play, is how to identify what to do when you have coronavirus. When do you go to the health facility for help? Or when can you do home-based care? And so our field staff have uh, adapted not necessarily everything in this guide, but at least parts and pieces of it that strengthen the care group module that uh, they are using in the field. And so we have had talks uh, lately with my colleagues here in Washington DC and in the field for perhaps beginning to develop a lesson about for this particular care group module around home-based care. As we know, hopefully the COVID-19 will continue to go away or there might be a research we don't know. So we are all hoping that things improve for the better, but we really need to prepare for the worst also, as we know. So with that, we're always trying to improve this care group module to ensure that in the event that there's a need for home-based care, there is a need as we speak, but in case there's a surge for the need, whether it is a surge in the COVID-19 or the health facilities are not able to provide services, when and how can you provide home-based home -based care for people with symptoms of uh, COVID-19? Yes, and our teams in the field have done a great job to adapt. Most of the countries, some of the countries do have uh, home-based care uh, protocols. And we have noticed that I have, I think for Kenya, I have had a, an opportunity to go through the Kenya one. It is great, and, uh, but I'm so excited about what we have here from this task force because it's more robust. There are a lot of things that I've seen that are of concern in the field, whether it's mental health uh, uh, care or um, children suffering during the COVID uh, pandemic. So those are things that have been included in this um, guide that are not in most of the protocols, the home-based care protocols that have been developed around the world by Ministry of many of some of the Ministry of Health. So uh, it's there. It's been an, a very welcome guide from our teams, and they've tried to really in, integrate bits if, uh, and pieces of it into their care group trainings. So with that, I will end. And if there are any questions, obviously, we'll be answering uh, those. And I think at the end of the this conversation. And I'll pass it back to Nicole. Thanks, Florence. Um, just for those of us um, on the call who maybe aren't working with care groups, Florence, do you mind to just give a, a quick overview on what the care group is? Um, just so that if, if people are working in that space or maybe they have a different name for it, that they could relate it over to their existing work. There might be... Uh, oh, yeah. David, can you go to the next slide, please? David, there might be um, a little bit of information that I added. Uh, see, it. I don't know if that's- Yes, good. absolutely. Yeah, Thanks. that is a lesson three, because the care group module we developed has three lessons, and lesson three talks primarily on what to do. What can we do if we, we or someone we know has uh, symptoms of uh, COVID-19? And for, um, I believe many of the people here, especially those who belong to the core group, do use uh, uh, care groups to some extent. And so uh, that's really a breakdown of what is in the lesson plans. It's, you know, games, because it's community level. So there are games, they do stories and stories that are relevant to whatever issue that uh, the module is addressing for this case, COVID-19, and then they'll go over the current practices. They'll talk about prevention and this, for this case, through hand washing and wearing of the masks and whatever else it is. And then they role play an activity, for instance, visiting a friend during coronavirus outbreak and you find that uh, they, you know, they have the symptoms. What, what do you do? And then discuss barriers and then practice and, uh, within pairs. And also we ask for commitments to do the work, to change uh, behaviors as we wish. So uh, just to, for the sake of those who don't know what the care group is, this is an approach that really engages uh, groups of people, groups of volunteers, usually uh, community-based health educators, 
who meet very regularly with project staff for training, for training supervision in the field. And uh, the volunteers are really key in this um, approach because they are selected by the communities because they belong to the communities. And um, sometimes uh, community leaders do, do participate as uh, care group members. And that selection is really done by the community members themselves. They select the volunteers that they think can uh, have the uh, capacity to, to deliver the work. So it's really just a group of volunteers, usually 10 to 15 volunteers, and each volunteer will, will be assigned to households to bring whatever messages uh, that uh, we are trying to get to the community level. And uh, we have uh, tremendous and all the organizations uh, represented at uh, who, the call represented in the call group have developed numerous care group um, modules that address almost any every issue that affects the communities we serve. Thanks, Warren. I hope that explains uh, gives a little bit clearer picture on what a care group is, and uh, suddenly we have links and we'll to more information on that. If you Wonderful. Wish. Thanks so much, Florence. That's really helpful. Uh, David, can you go to the next slide now? So now I'd like to introduce Rumbi, who's with us today from the Ministry of Health and Child Care in Zimbabwe. She's the Health Promotion Manager, and she's on the Risk Communication and Community Engagement uh, for Response Pillar for COVID-19. And she is going to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing uh, Rumbi, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, good day, everyone, and I um, hope you can all hear me. Uh, I'm going to present on um, what we have been doing in Zimbabwe uh, for COVID-19 response, especially uh, using the home-based care um, guide. Uh, so in Zimbabwe, our um, COVID-19 cases are mostly in the urban areas. However, with the um, increase in uh, community transmission, we are having uh, cases uh, increasing also in the rural areas. And um, our population in the rural areas is uh, about 70%. Hence, the need to continue engaging the communities in the rural areas in um, COVID-19 uh, prevention. So um, uh, Pengia Zimbabwe AIDS Trust um, has been supporting us uh, with uh, technical support for community and facility-based uh, provider trainings. And these trainings were targeting uh, primary and uh, secondary level facilities, which are the clinics and also the district hospitals. Uh, next slide, um, David. So I'm going to discuss uh, much on the response and how we have used the guide to help us in the trainings that we're conducting for the uh, facility-based and community-level um, individuals. Uh, and uh, we used uh, basically this guide because it um, uh, was spoke more to our um, COVID-19 response pillars, which includes the management and coordination, uh, infection prevention and control issues, uh, risk communication, uh, surveillance, uh, testing, uh, security, uh, sub supply chain, case management, and also the ports of entry. So this guide um, has given us uh, a lot of information and it has um, a scope of um, things that complement our um, pillar response. Uh, next slide. Uh, thank you so much. So for our training participants, uh, for the facility-based teams, we had uh, doctors, nurses, health promotion officers, uh, lab scientists, and also the environmental health officers. 
uh, we who play a, a big role in uh, most of our um, pillar response. Then for the community teams, uh, we had the community health workers. Uh, these are helping us a lot, especially in um, risk communication and also providing some services, uh, especially surveillance in the community. And also the ambulance and um, other drivers, the nurse aides, hospital security, guards, uh, cleaners, and general hands. Uh, next slide, David. So for the facility-based uh, teams, after the training, um, they would uh, make sure they set up their facility so that they are ready uh, for COVID-19 response. They would look at issues of management and coordination. Um, and also they would create a COVID-19 response team that included uh, community representatives. So each clinic would have a COVID-19 team that had um, health workers and also community representatives so that they would um, coordinate uh, response issues in the community. And also um, would ensure uh, compliance of uh, key pathways um, where they would screen people at the point of entry on the uh, health facility and also make sure that uh, the separation of suspects from everyone else and uh, setting up testing and screening um, points where people, the suspects may be tested and um, also mobilizing resources. For example, the personal protective equipment and also supplies like drugs and oxygen needed for the response. And um, there was uh, use of uh, a self-assessment uh, where we see if uh, the facility is ready for triaging, if uh, all resources are available, and if the staff needed is also available for the facility. Next slide. Uh, next slide, David, please. Okay, so, uh, sorry, the previous slide. Yes. Uh, so on facility-based teams, um, the providers seek information on these topics uh, to provide guidance to the community. So these are some of the topics that um, the providers uh, really needed uh, to know and we, they got most of the information from the guide we were using to train. Uh, so they wanted to know how to do isolation at a uh, household level and how uh, to identify a contact and if so, what to do uh, with those contacts and also um, the type of masks that are okay to use um, in the community. If it's a cloth mask, um, uh, what type of material and what type of uh, uh, lining that is needed there. And also how the community um, coordinates nutritious foods uh, for those in the quarantine. Uh, and uh, also issues to do with the mental health when people needed to know strategies for emotional support during uh, quarantine or even home isolation. Uh, next slide, David. Uh, thank you. So uh, for the community health workers, uh, it was an opportunity where we saw that um, uh, helping them know about uh, COVID-19 response and uh, how they would do it would increase uh, linkages where screening for COVID-19 while providing other services 
uh, was going to be ideal. So uh, our health workers uh, really provide uh, other services like um, treatment of diarrhea, testing of malaria, and um, other stuff. And uh, during that time, if they could also screen for COVID-19, that would help to identify cases um, immediately. And also issues of reporting, uh, where well the health workers uh, are doing their activities and providing reports, uh, this could also help us get uh, information across all pillars on um, people that have been identified and screened, um, issues of uh, risk communication uh, activities they have done. And also this would also help to increase awareness to the communities, uh, where communities are more alert and they notify authorities of potential cases. Next slide, please. So uh, for the role in the community, for the health workers, um, it's to disseminate correct information to the community. Uh, so the guide uh, provided simplified information. We've loaded a lot of um, infodemics in the community uh, since uh, information was just loaded and uh, there was uh, much information, even uh, information that the community members um, did not understand. But uh, this guide is providing simplified information that is um, easy to digest for the community members. And also, uh, these health workers, community health workers uh, need to provide information for community leaders and influencers. So they cited that they need um, a two-page uh, leaflets so that uh, they provide the key messages that the community leaders and influencers might use uh, to ensure their community uh, are updated with uh, COVID-19 information. And also they need to attend and ensure compliance with um, infection prevention and control guidelines at gatherings. They usually attend funerals um, and uh, other community gatherings and uh, they need to recommend uh, issues of uh, physical distancing during these uh, gatherings. Then uh, link facility and um, referral systems to contact and uh, support cases. Um, so they need to identify contacts and suspects and link them to the facility so that um, the correct response is um, uh, given for such uh, cases. And lastly, check on our community members in quarantine for the signs and symptoms and um, provide referral and also get information on when to end the isolation, when it is appropriate to end the isolation. Uh, next slide, please. So for the challenges, um, there are health system constraints where uh, the main issue is human resources. Um, we also have shortages of uh, uh, personal protective equipment and medicines, including oxygen. So training was there to emphasize on how to work and improve within the prevailing environment uh, especially uh, how to use whatever is available efficiently and uh, avoid wastages, and also how to uh, provide uh, information on uh, preventive issues like hand washing. In the absence of um, uh, water, there is limited water, especially uh, in the urban areas where water is mostly erratic, 
and uh, people have to fetch water from the borehole. And also issues of um, washing cloth masks. Um, where most of uh, people in Zimbabwe are using cloth masks uh, when visiting public places. Uh, and lastly, emphasizing on triaging. All right. Uh, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Yep. Oh, all right, thank you. So I was saying also issues of uh, triaging uh, in the facility-based setting uh, so that appropriate care is given to each individual. Then lastly, uh, on lessons learned, uh, we need uh, strong community and facility linkages to strengthen the facility. Um, since the facility is not the only solution, most of the cases um, are being also identified in the community. They are being isolated in the community and quarantine is taking place in the community so that linkage needs to be set up so that um, there is proper referral and all. And we need simplified information um, especially uh, for the community members who would really like to know how to prevent themselves in this scenario. And uh, they also need to take away messages where necessary that might help to reinforce what um, information has been given. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Rumbi. Thanks for sharing about the great work that you're doing. And um, I think that your point about the strong linkages between the community and the facility is important. Um, and hopefully, we can continue to make more resources available that will be applicable for a greater field use. So at this time, I'll hand it over to Helen um, with Medic Mobile, who's going to share a little bit about the work that they're doing um, from a mobile application. So Helen, over to you. Thank you so much, Nicole. And David, if you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I'm speaking here on behalf of a partnership between Medic Mobile and Damagi, and I'm going to give you a bit of background on the work that we're doing together before diving into how we've used the Home-Based Care Reference Guide uh, to help guide and shape a shared mobile app design for home-based care uh, for use by frontline workers, uh, particularly at last mile settings in low and middle income countries. Uh, as many of us on the call are aware, over the last decade, we've made a lot of progress on developing and deploying digital tools for low and middle income countries with an eye towards frontline workers um, and a particular focus on equipping community healthcare workers with digital tools. Both Medic Mobile and Demagi uh, develop and deploy two of the most widely used platforms for equipping frontline workers with mobile apps. Um, and we've done this work, um, both organizations, for almost, if not over a decade. Um, and COVID-19 and the pandemic really, you know, sort of shifted, I think, how we approach this work. Uh, in Mar March and April, both of our organizations pivoted quite dramatically um, to building apps uh, for COVID-19 use cases and working with existing and new partners to rapidly deploy those apps across the world. Um, and we also recognized that this pandemic created an opportunity and really a, a demand for more collaboration within our field. So since May, with the support of the Rockefeller Foundation, Medic and Demagi have been working together uh, to align, improve, and share digital applications, first specifically for COVID, um, and we're hoping that this will uh, build a, a further collaborative environment um, across the organization. David, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Uh, within this partnership, we think there's um, some really exciting opportunities for growth um, and really for thinking about digital tools in a collaborative um, and partnering way. Uh, there's the power of combined scale, thinking about 
uh, the coverage that multiple organizations working on a shared framework can achieve across the world. Um, there's also uh, really an exciting element of using a time of instability to work together um, and to design tools that have shared applications, but also that draw from available evidence and contribute to the global health and the digital health community. There's also a feeling and sense of urgency um, within the context of COVID. I think we really heard that from Rumbi, and I think we'll hear that in the discussion that as the pandemic evolves, all of our work um, is being set by the timeline of the pandemic and we're responding um, with increasing uh, attention to the needs of communities, both for direct and indirect effects of the pandemic. Um, and finally, we, we felt that this collaboration gives us an opportunity to think about um, what some of the standard use cases can be for digital tools, um, where are there gaps or areas for improvement, and we really felt that home-based care presented um, a really exciting opportunity to create a shared design. Uh, next slide, please, David. Part of the work that we've done together was also to identify um, a shared conceptual framework where both Medic, Mobile, and Damagi had use cases either in development or deployed for different digital applications. And you'll see, um, I won't spend too much time on this slide, but you'll see there was quite a robust evaluation that was conducted across our two organizations and the types of digital tools that we'd created. But we recognized that there is an opportunity to think more critically about a home-based care use case, uh, particularly in the context of patient care for COVID-19, as well as adapting uh, primary health care delivery mechanisms in the context of the pandemic. Uh, we really felt as part of our partnership that there was importance to highlight both the direct but also indirect effects of COVID within our work. Um, next slide, please, David. And that brings us to our collaboration um, on developing applications for frontline workers during COVID. Um, as we've been curating this suite of COVID-19 response applications and highlighting opportunities across our organizations for shared design, we felt that questions about home-based care, um, and specifically in the context of caring for patients with COVID-19, was a clear opportunity for us to think together. And as we began to do a bit of a landscape and literature review, we found that the core group's home-based care reference guide really was a great starting point for us in thinking through how to translate um, care protocols that were rapidly evolving over time into a digital workflow that included both care provision and educational components along the way. Um, and we came up with a design for this workflow that really highlighted different elements of uh, a community healthcare workers day to day care provision with elements of COVID-19 screening, um, referral questions, and then really getting into what does home based care look like in terms of a home assessment, caretaker preparation, and follow-up and continuous touch points with a care worker. What types of targeted educational materials would be required at each point of that care provision um, workflow in order to ensure that community healthcare workers and frontline workers of all types had the resources they needed to provide care in the best and most equitable way, and that household members, household caretakers, and patients themselves felt that they were continuing to get information that they needed across the different steps of care provision from symptom screening to a suggestion to stay at home and receive home-based care and follow through during that time of containment within their home. Uh, we've also worked, um, you know, with, with Nicole and had a few conversations about the resource um, and reference guide that have been really useful. Next slide, please, David. Um, and, you know, I think within the design of the application and the collaborative work that we've done across Demagi and Medic Mobile, we really wanted to highlight that there's opportunities for us to think through um, remote education and training for frontline workers through the information that's contained within the core group's reference guide, as well as uh, ongoing support for care provision uh, that's required to facilitate home-based care, um, including but not limited to 
thing, uh, considerations around messaging, touch points with households, and the role of supportive supervision in enabling home-based care uh, in many communities around the world that are uh, particularly for cadres that are equipped with digital tools. David, next slide, please. Within our shared design, uh, we wanted to think through the different user personas that were likely to be engaging in home-based care from both the perspective of care providers, uh, but also patients and household members who would be receiving education from CHWs to provide care within the home and patients themselves. We found that as we thought through the design of our reference app workflow, uh, that really we wanted to center on the experience of the community healthcare worker who would be engaging in care provision from symptom screening to the home assessment, um, follow-ups within the home to ensure that care is being provided, and with an acknowledgement that in some cases, referrals would be required even though home-based care was initiated. We also wanted to foreground the role of the CHW supervisor or other facility-based supervisors within different health systems um, and highlight that you know, the CH supervisor role really has evolved in the context of COVID, particularly in areas with mobility restrictions where we're hoping that supervisors will assist with and verify CHW education and training completion, but also support um, CHWs in their work in terms of additional coaching when needed. We also wanted to highlight the household care provider. Um, within the context of home-based care, there's an emphasis and I think a, a request for care from members of households and those care providers need to have education um, and attention given to the labor that is being asked of them. And within this workflow, we really wanted to have targeted education for those household care providers, um, particularly around the risks um, and transmissibility of COVID-19, but also so that those household care providers felt supported by the community health care workers and broader health system. And finally, we also wanted to make sure that we foreground the role of the patient themselves, uh, that the patient has an understanding of what's happening um, and that they understand the imperative of both receiving care within the home, a quarantine period for COVID-19, but that they also understand that the CHW or other frontline worker will be a touch point um, and a facilitator of care during a period of isolation within their family. Um, next slide, please, David. Within our design, to get a little bit more detailed, we have a care provision workflow that is complemented by uh, set educational modules. This care provision workflow begins with patient symptom screening. There's a flexibility to this design that allows for either a COVID specific workflow or for patient symptom screening to be integrated, as Rumbi was speaking about, into existing primary health care protocols um, for household visits. You could see a screening workflow being integrated into um, a broader ICCM assessment, um, into sort of routine household visits that are provided by community healthcare workers or other frontline workers, or into a facility-based um, workflow that's enabled by digital tools. If a patient is showing signs or symptoms of COVID-19 and is assessed to be an eligible candidate for home-based care, the workflow transitions to a home-based care assessment that includes both an evaluation of the patient's residence, but also a discussion with the household care provider. Um, and that includes targeted education um, for the caretaker, including preparedness for delivering care within the home. We then have home-based care follow-ups at targeted points during the 14-day period, as well as the option for um, a household care provider or a patient in some cases to reach out if needed um, if their symptoms begin to worsen. And finally, there's the inclusion of facility referrals and follow-ups as needed given Ministry of Health and specific program referral protocols. Across each point of this care provision workflow, there's also educational modules including background education for community health care workers prior to engaging in home-based care supported by digital tools. And this includes an introduction to COVID as well as an introduction to home-based care, 
um, as well as specifically targeted frontline worker home-based care education that's also use case specific. So if we are adapting existing um, digital workflows, such as ICCM or even in some cases antenatal care, um, there's a walkthrough for how those workflows have changed within their mobile application or other digital tool. And then there's also caretaker preparedness education. And these educational modules, I should say, um, are being co-developed across Medic Mobile and Demagi, but also with um, sort of the assistance and, and input from the digital medic group out of Stanford. Um, next slide, please, David. as well as create dashboard visualizations. This is work that is ongoing, um, but it's important for us to think through uh, community healthcare worker or other frontline health worker training and engagement and having process indicators that allow us to measure that over time, as well as allowing us to measure interaction with educational modules and the different care provision modules. Our hope is to have um, shared analytics that enable um, similar indicators to be tracked across deployments of our home-based care reference application for both the community health toolkit and ComCare. So there's a standard set of monitoring indicators across the use of these digital tools um, on multiple platforms. Next slide, please, David. And finally, uh, our hope is that our shared design for home-based care focused on COVID-19 will allow us actually to extend beyond a simple COVID-19 use case to a broader suite of uh, adaptations to primary healthcare workflows that are supported by digital tools. Um, we believe that this paired design that we have that looks at both care provision and complementary education will be applied across a broad suite of digital workflows and helps us to think through how best to support frontline workers, particularly community healthcare workers, and strengthen health systems uh, with an eye towards really building out and building upon our shared conceptual framework um, and think about what delivery of primary care looks like in the context of COVID and during the period of recovery. I'm happy to speak about this more during the discussion, but I know I'm three minutes over and I want to save time for a robust conversation. Um, thank you so much for your time and look forward to your questions. And I have Neil Lesh, the Chief Strategy Officer um, at Demagi here to help answer questions about our partnership and the work that we're doing on digital tools. Uh, Nicole, over to you. Thanks, Helen, and thanks for that great presentation. Uh, it's really interesting to hear about all of the great work that's being done in this space. So at this time, we are going to move into the discussion. Um, David, if you could go to the next slide, please. And Anne is going, oh, sorry. Hold on, we have a poll. <laughs> uh, before we get into the discussion, if you could all uh, complete this next poll, and what we'd like to know is a little bit more about what the greatest need is for your project at this time um, and the communities that you serve. So if you could complete the poll and, um, and then we'll kick into our discussion. While we are going into the next slide, um, I will introduce Anne. She is the Senior Technical Advisor for Gender-Based Violence and Violence Against Children at LVCT Health Kenya. And she is going to share with us a little bit about the work that they're doing related to sexual and gender-based violence, both from a programming perspective, as well as recommendations for uh, what individuals can do at the household level um, and what recommendations programmers can make for uh, that guidance as we move forward through the COVID-19 pandemic um, and onwards. So, um, David, that's okay if you take us to the next slide, please, while um, Anne uh, shares a little bit more about her work. And then after Anne's discussion, I will um, 
bring in some of the other participants that we have for the discussion. So, Anne, over to you. Um, thank you, Nicole. I hope you can all hear me loud and clear. We can um, hear you. From wherever we are. Great. Thank you. So it's absolutely brilliant to hear what has been done by the rest of the presenters and it's great being on board to share what it is that we've done in LVCT. I'll just give a brief um, introduction to what, who we are at LVCT Health. We are a local um, non-governmental organization, NGO, that was registered in 2001 in Kenya. Um, we primarily, we started off um, on dealing matters related to HIV testing, care and treatment. But now we've actually expanded our scope, expanded our scope to cover um, gender-based violence programming and community health programming, HIV, of course, as we started off, and sexual and reproductive health matters, particularly amongst the youth. And we serve a um, multitude of populations, especially the key populations. So female sex workers, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and adolescent girls and young women in most of our programs. Um, Kenya has 47 counties, um, probably similar to provinces or shires, and, and we cover about half of them, mostly in service provision, and also at the various policy tables now that health has been devolved in Kenya, at the various um, policy tables, technical working groups for those four thematic areas. So thank you very much, Nicole and Tim, for giving us the opportunity to talk about SGBV today. So imagine data shows that since the breakout of COVID globally, um, violence against women and girls has certainly intensified, particularly domestic violence, it has intensified globally. And this is because there's been pre-existing social norms that seem to tolerate violence against women, girls, and um, children and also the previous gender inequalities. But now with COVID, there's been economic and social stress caused by the pandemic, which we're all aware of, that has been seen to be triggers for the, for the domestic violence actually occurring in some households. So what, I'll give the case scenario of what we've actually seen in Kenya. Some of the COVID response plans, and these are the same as the global ones, but I'll give the Kenyan perspective, that have been put in place, such as and restricted movement, social isolation measures. This has also been seen to increase in Kenya. We are having that as well. And this has been seen to increase the violence perpetration at household or community level. Many women, children, adolescents were in lockdown at one point or another where even cities were. There were boundaries put around where people could not move. There's been a curfew. And essentially what we're getting back from some of the beneficiaries that I've mentioned was that they're actually being locked down with their abusers, with their perpetrators, where else they're being cut off from any normal support services, like reaching out to friends or walking to the facility in case your facility is beyond the borderline or um, the lockdowns brought about social disrupt, the social networks were disrupted. So we found a lot of reports coming to us that during this period particularly because of the measures that are there which are there granted and they have serve a purpose in curbing COVID spread from one from one to another the community transmission especially but it still had this ripple effects of violence occurring in the community so a similar scenario to what was reported globally in the intensification of the domestic violence or is also what we saw in Kenya so for example, in the last, in the two weeks after the government um, announced the curfew, one of the councils, this is the National Council of Administration of Justice in the judiciary sector, they actually announced that sexual offenses have shot up significantly during that period. At LVCT, because GBV, post GBV services are one of the ones that we actually offer to our beneficiaries, we sprang into action and you are very mindful to tally the number of GBV cases that were being reported within the six weeks. The first six weeks since the first case of COVID was announced in Kenya, and that was in March. And for sure, what you saw, there was indeed a rise in the number of cases and um, compared to the period just before COVID and this period last year. So it was easy for us to follow what the global data was coming up with in terms of the response plan and the additional risk that it's placing in households for us to make the conclusion that perhaps um, there's, there's definitely a rise 
in the number of GBV cases being reported, the number of violence against children being reported, and those matters cannot be handled separately. So you cannot have a COVID response plan and not address gender-based violence and violence against children, particularly at the community level. Those two things needed to go hand in hand. So the global data was actually calling it the shadow pandemic and the need to actually streamline the services. So as much as you're addressing COVID, you also have to address this monster that's come up in the name of GBV at community level. So in order to prevent and respond to sexual and gender-based violence as a, at LVCT, within the counties where we work in the about 27 counties of the 47 in Kenya, we actually came up with dedicated actions and strategies that would work particularly with community health volunteers as one group. And this was because they tend to be the first responders when people experience violence in the community. So our first target group was community health volunteers. Our second target group was the community members and the community members included the beneficiaries that we serve, that's the key population who have an additional, they're more vulnerable populations, the key populations, women, adolescent girls, those living with HIV, the female sex workers, the MSMs, and also we deliberately targeted parents. And I'll just talk briefly in what, on what we actually did, the strategies that we actually put in place and to try and prevent and respond to GBV even during this COVID. So I'll start off with the community health volunteers. The first thing was that they went underwent training and sensitization as frontline workers in the COVID pandemic in line with the Ministry of Health guidelines in Kenya. So the Ministry of Health um, accepted that the community health workers have a very key role in, in mitigating either risk of COVID or linkage, as we've already seen from the other countries like Zimbabwe, the case studies that we've been given. So the Ministry of Health developed a curriculum that was used to train CHVs as frontline workers and raise awareness in, on how they should educate the community members during household visits on how to prevent COVID. And in case if one of them is positive, one of the household members is positive, what to do next in terms of referring them to an appropriate health facility and the measures that they have to put in place at the household level. Um, also just specifically on COVID, the household member were also given the hotline numbers by the community health volunteers. 719 is the Kenya national number to ring and they provided them with the respective county representatives, the names of the respective county representatives for follow-up and management. So aside from the COVID and how to handle it, we were very deliberate on sensitizing and training them on what to do should a member of public, should a community member, should any of the girls or anybody they interact for that matter, what to do when somebody discloses to them that they've undergone any form of violence or if they have a high on how to have a high index of suspicion. So as they're doing their whole household visits, they are able to you know, pick up the telltale signs of either the children in this house undergoing violence or there's something amiss in their house and they suspect that violence might have occurred. So we took them through a very deliberate training on what to do and some of the components that we actually covered was how to observe guiding principles when handling survivors of violence. You know, things like um, the best interest of the survivor, offering survivor-centered care, respecting the wishes of the household member, even though they, for example, disclose that they're undergoing violence, um, and, and they don't want to seek, you know, to seek help from the nearby facility, then we are able to talk to, to sensitize the community health volunteers on what to do in such a scenario so that they don't actually place the survivor in additional risk. And bearing in mind right now, there's curfews, um, as I've said, there's the restricted movement. So even seeking um, services from a facility might not be the easiest thing for the survivor. So we took the CHVs through how to, how to observe the guiding principles, how to offer first line support, which is the psychological first aid given to, to survivors of violence. And by definition, according to WHO, first line support is essentially the minimum level of primary psychological support and validation of the household members experience that should be received 
if they are survivors of violence, if they've disclosed violence to, to, the, to the community health volunteer. So we took them through steps of how to offer practical survivor-centered empathetic counseling approaches that respond to the client's needs at that time that are also wary of the COVID response plan. So this would always work hand in hand. Um, the COVID approach and reducing the COVID um, infection rate in the community as well as addressing the needs that the survivor might probably have at that point. So we also took them about, we also took them through um, sessions on how to respect privacy and, and that has been documented to have helped people who have been through various upsetting or stressful events, which was very common again because of the effects of what you're seeing with, with COVID at community level. Um, we emphasized to them, even as we're training through that, that first line support can be offered by anyone. So any of the CHVs, regardless of their background, with the right skills, we can actually offer the acronym as given by, by WHO, the LIVES acronym, which stands for listening, inquiring, validating, enhancing safety and support. And one of the key points when sharing this information with the CHVs was how to also assess immediate risk and safety planning. Again, immediate risk and safety planning in terms of violence occurrence and COVID. And some of the measures that the CHV would tell the, the survivor, and this is after they've observed that they're not placing the survivor at additional risk, is should they feel like they need to be evacuated at that point, then that is a point that the survivor can get in touch with the referral networks and be able to organize for that. If there are any places where the survivor can reach to any friends, basically it was, an, uh, it was a survivor led, it was a process in the, in the safety planning, but we improved or we, we, we developed the skills of the CHVs to be able to do the immediate risk um, even in terms of domestic violence reoccurring and advising the survivor on what next steps to take, either to reach out to a trusted friends, they need to make sure that if they need to evacuate immediately with the children, that they have somewhere that they can go to, their child's um, friendly shelters in the region where they can get numbers to, the important documents that they have to take with them, like passport, if it's their ID, identification card, um, birth certificates, you know, the typical um, important documents as part of the safety planning. So we were able to take the CHVs using appropriate job aids on the right questions to ask. And at all times, we emphasize that the safety of the survivor is, is paramount. So if it means, for example, developing a code word, like for some of us, we tell them, you can use a statement like, um, today is a cold day. It's July in, in Kenya. It's cold, but that was cold for the survivor to know that, you know, they're asking me that. So if I say yes, then it means they've understood that I need to be evacuated. If I say no, and this was more common, especially when there was somebody else in the house and the CHV could not ascertain whether that person was the offending, you know, perpetrator or the non offending or the offending caregiver in cases of children. So we were able to take them through that, we provided them with job aids that they can walk around with, they can be able to just go and internalize so that when they go to their household visits, some of these questions would just come naturally because talking about violence is, is a heavy topic. And more often than not, we find that people, whether at facility level, or even at the household level, they, they find it hard to disclose because in our culture, it's still one of those silent topics. So we were able to take um, the CHVs through that intensive training and do a lot of value clarification for them and also how to offer and to promote gender equality as they offer services. They needed to take into consideration that for women, treating women and men when it comes to responding to violence that they may call might be different. There are certain um, considerations that they'll have to put in place. So we took them through that. And additionally, they were also sensitized on, as I said, observing the guiding principles when handling survivors. And we emphasized on the CHVs on respecting the wishes on the survivor, but at the same time, giving them the information that the survivor would find useful enough to be able to make informed decisions in a manner that they'd feel empowered now that they have access to perhaps hotlines, 
or access to shelter numbers. If they feel they need to call, then the CHV is there to help them. So the third thing that we did for them also was to emphasize the need of them developing very elaborate, comprehensive directories. And these are things that sometimes they did and they admitted, sometimes they didn't really, you know, they, they took it for granted with the contacts that they have, they felt that was enough. But right now the demand for shelters has increased because of gender-based violence and this COVID thing. The, the need for facilities, close by facilities, because again, with the curfew and with the lockdowns, some, at one point there were counties where you were restricted from moving even to another county. So say for example, we're in Nairobi and somebody is in, is in another county in Eastern part of Kenya. They could not access the referral hospital in Nairobi because of the lockdown. So what we tasked all our CHVs is because they're all within their respective areas where they live. They tend to work in those units where they know of. They need to walk around and figure out or map out all the locally, avail locally available services that they think the service provide, the survivor, sorry, would require. So beyond health, they were supposed to, and they actually did this, they developed a referral directory that had the legal service providers and where they were short of these services, we were able to give them links to other implementing partners who perhaps have programs within the same area. But they did a wonderful job of this after walking around. They came up with a list of legal service providers. They came up with a list for vocational training institutions. They came up with a list of shelters within the area. And of course, the national hotline numbers were there where they could pass on these numbers to people who perhaps have survivors who have access to mobile phones and that would not put them in additional risk again of, of when they call, they'd be able to, to reach out using those national hotline numbers. So this is something that we actually, even post the training, we actually went back and to the units where primarily we, we work in to check on these directories because now we realize more than ever, it's the local service providers who are stepping up now to serve the community and the community members, the household, the children who are experiencing violence. So we were able to help them, you know, develop this elaborate effective functional directory and also other issues and um, not issues other details that were needed for example the opening hours and the focal point person what populations they serve because you find some implementing partners or service providers and have a bias in terms of the populations they serve especially those who work with people with disabilities who live in the communities and also having additional they're more vulnerable even in terms of getting the support, the monetary support. So we just made sure that the CHVs have this effective directory and they are sure that um, any number there is actually functional. What we also told them in terms of referral during the training was emphasized on how to offer a warm referral. If they could, they should walk the survivor to the next service delivery point since it's within their locality anyway especially cases for sexual, sexual violence and cases of violence against children. They can link directly with the, with the children officer and evacuate the child if necessary. For the ones who are over 18, they can walk them to the facility because um, data shows that referrals sometimes, that there are certain barriers that come up at community level that might hinder um, a survivor. Even though they need the services, they don't actually go. It's, it's, there's a lot of guilt, shame, there's a lot of lack of knowledge on where to go. So we actually asked the CHVs if they can actually accompany the survivor to go to the facility and also explain to them at the facility that when you go there, of course, they're going to take your temperature, they're going to check your, you know, your COVID status, whether they've ever been tested before, they'll address the COVID, but primarily they'll be able to walk the survivor to the clinical officer who will be able to do a head to toe examination of any violence that they might have experienced. So we are very deliberate on the, on the service directories and offering warm referrals for the survivors. What and, we did- And yes. I, I see that there's a lot of interest in the chat box about um, oh. all of the information that you're presenting. I think that oh. you sparked a, a lot of interest around um, additional resources that you might be able to offer and okay. um, connecting with some people in the field that would like to um, potentially 
use some resources or just um, have a conversation with you after the webinar to learn even more details about your work. So um, we only have a couple of minutes left. So if okay. Anna, if you have any final thoughts and then we're gonna um, go into wrap up and we can make the appropriate connections um, to you after the call. Do you have any final thoughts on? Um, just to, to one minute would even be now if you also shared with them IEC materials that's the job is you shared with them via whatsapp and also raising awareness on the consequences of all so I talked of three groups there was a community health volunteers the second one was the parents and I think the parents it has been captured pretty well in the in the resource guide itself we sent out bulk messages on positive parenting what to do now during COVID and should they experience violence themselves as, as parents, you know, intimate partner violence, which was a key threat, or they observe other children who are going through violence. All our messages always had the tagline, call 1190, which is our hotline number. And from there, they would receive telecounseling and also referral to other facilities because our hotline serves the whole nation. It's a nationwide number. The third group was for the beneficiaries themselves. And all the message, messages that we sent were cognizant of evolving capacities and how adolescent, perhaps their messaging could be different to what, how we communicate with the parents. So again, even for that, you shared the same messages on should you be undergoing any form of violence? If this has happened to you, do not blame yourself. Call 1190 for support. So we were able to actually handle those three aspects when it comes to SGBV or GBV particularly during this COVID period. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Anne. Thank you so much for that uh, wealth of information. I think that it's a really important topic right now that we all continue, uh, that we need to continue to keep top of mind. So with that, um, I'm going to ask David for the results of the last poll, and then we're going to uh, wrap up. So it looks like what people are most interested in, uh, COVID-19 materials in local languages and facilitation guide and training manuals, great. So we are working on the local languages. Um, so we'll be able to um, get those, some of the more recent ones up on the website. And then we will also post uh, the training PowerPoint deck that we've created, as well as the two page reference guide. So, um, with that, I believe there's one or two last things to wrap up. Um, if you could just drop a note in the chat box about something that you learned today or a new idea that you plan to take away from the presentation. Um, and we can, if you'd like to, uh, if, you, if there's a specific presenter or a specific topic that you're interested in, um, learning more about, uh, please go ahead and put that in the message box and, and we can try and follow up with you appropriately. Uh, thank you so much. I think that there's one last slide just as a wrap up and back to you, Julie. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> I, I really appreciated everything that was discussed today. And as usual, it's always um, difficult to get to all of the questions, but I do thank everyone for their active participation. Before we officially close the call, I would like you all to know that we'll be sending out a follow-up email with highlights from the call, along with a recording and a transcript. We ask that you all share this email widely with your networks. This is a critical issue with uh, and with your support. Core Group, our members and our global partners can continue to support our colleagues around the world with innovative and trusted information on COVID-19 for home-based care. Future COVID calls will address continuity of care, especially for other infectious diseases such as malaria and HIV. Another call will look at the issue of stigma. Uh, we got some great um, uh, inputs from you today on how we should be addressing this at both the country level and in the international media. And we hope that you will join us for these calls in September. 
Many thanks to our very active and committed co-chairs, Barbara and Nicole. You've done such a wonderful job uh, along with Florence and the, the 12 partners and the other global partners who are working to really address this really important uh, issue. I also want to thank uh, all of the presenters and case uh, study uh, presenters and the guest speakers, excuse me. And most importantly, I want to thank all who joined us today for, your, uh, for this call. Thank you for your inputs. Thank you for your thoughts. But most importantly, thank you for your support. Um, this is month five now of um, this, uh, this pandemic, which has created this amazing global virtual community. And we are very uh, appreciative of the time you spent with us today. The call is now officially closed.